Chapter Three of The Wolf Hunters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Brian Aidy. The Wolf Hunters by James Oliver Curwood. Chapter Three. Roderick sees the footprint. Rod was now plunged for the first time in his life into the heart of the wilderness. Seated in the bow of the birch bark canoe which was carrying them up the sturgeon, with Wabi close behind him, he drank in the wild beauties of the forests and swamps through which they slipped almost as noiselessly as shadows, his heart thumping in joyous excitement, his eyes constantly on the alert for signs of the big game which Wabi told him was on all sides of them. Across his knees, ready for instant use, was Wabi's repeating rifle. The air was keen with the freshness left by night frosts. At times, deep masses of gold and crimson forests shut them in. At others, black forests of spruce came down to the river's edge. Again they would pass silently through great swamps of tamaracks. In this vast desolation there was a mysterious quiet, except for the occasional sounds of wildlife. Partridges drummed back in the woods, flocks of ducks got up with a great rush of wings at almost every turn, and once, late in the morning of the first day out, Rod was thrilled by a crashing in the undergrowth scarcely a stone's throw from the canoe. He could see saplings twisting and bending, and heard Wabi whisper behind him, A moose! They were words to set his hands trembling and his whole body quivering with anticipation. There was in him now none of the old hunter's coolness, none of the almost stolid indifference with which men of the big north hear these sounds of the wild things about them. Rod had yet to see his first big game. That moment came in the afternoon. The canoe had skimmed lightly around a bend in the river. Beyond this bend, a mass of dead driftwood had wedged against the shore, and this driftwood, as the late sun sank behind the forests, was bathed in a warm yellow glow. And basking in this glow, as he loves to do at the approach of winter nights, was an animal, the sight of which drew a sharp, excited cry from between Rod's lips. In an instant he had recognized it as a bear. The animal was taken completely by surprise and was less than half a dozen rods away. Quick as a flash, and hardly realizing what he was doing, the boy drew his rifle to his shoulder, took quick aim, and fired. The bear was already clambering up the driftwood, but stopped suddenly at the report, slipped as if about to fall back, then continued his retreat. "'You hit him!' shouted Wabi. "'Quick, try him again!' Rod's second shot seemed to have no effect. In his excitement he jumped to his feet, forgetting that he was in a frail canoe, and took a last shot at the big black beast that was just about to disappear over the edge of the driftwood. Both Wabi and his Indian companion flung themselves on the shore side of their birch and dug their paddles deep into the water, but their efforts were unavailing to save their reckless comrade. Unbalanced by the concussion of his gun, Rod plunged backward into the river, but before he had time to sink, Wabi reached over and grabbed him by the arm. "'Don't make a move and hang on to the gun,' he warned. "'If we try to get you in here, we'll all go over.' He made a sign to the Indian, who swung the canoe slowly inshore. Then he grinned down into Rod's dripping, unhappy face. "'By George, that last shot was a dandy for a tenderfoot. You got your bear!' Despite his uncomfortable position, Rod gave a whoop of joy, and no sooner did his feet touch solid bottom than he loosed himself from Wabi's grip and plunged toward the driftwood. On its very top he found the bear, as dead as a bullet through its side and another through its head could make it. Standing there beside his first big game, dripping and shivering, he looked down upon the two who were pulling their canoe ashore and gave a series of triumphant whoops that could have been heard half a mile away. "'It's a camp and a fire for you,' laughed Wabi, hurrying up to him. "'This is better luck than I thought you'd have, Rod. We'll have a glorious feast tonight and a fire of this driftwood that will show you what makes life worth the living up here in the north. Ho, Mookie!' he called to the old Indian. "'Cut this fellow up, will you? I'll make camp. "'Can we keep the skin?' asked Rod. "'It's my first, you know, and—' "'Of course we can. "'Give us a hand with the fire, Rod. "'It will keep you from catching cold.' In the excitement of making their first camp, Rod almost forgot that he was soaked to the skin and that night was falling about them. The first step was the building of a fire, and soon a great crackling and almost smokeless blaze was throwing its light and heat for thirty feet about. Wabi now brought blankets from the canoe, stripped off a part of his own clothes, made Rod undress, and soon had the youth swathed in dry togs, while his wet ones were hung up close to the fire. For the first time Rod saw the making of a wilderness shelter. Whistling cheerily, Wabi got an axe from the canoe, went to the edge of the cedars, and cut armful after armful of saplings and boughs. Tying his blankets about himself, 
Rod helped to carry these, a laughable and grotesque figure as he stumbled about clumsily in his efforts. Within half an hour the cedar shelter was taking form. Two crotched saplings were driven into the ground eight feet apart, and from one to the other, resting in the crotches, was placed another sapling which formed the ridge pole, and from this pole there ran slantwise to the earth half a dozen others, making a framework upon which the cedar boughs were piled. By the time the old Indian had finished his bear, the home was completed, and with its beds of sweet-smelling boughs, the campfire in front, and the dense wilderness about them growing black with the approach of night, Rod thought that nothing in picture-book or story could quite equal the reality of that moment. And when, a few moments later, great bear steaks were broiling over a mass of coals, and the odor of coffee mingled with that of meal cake sizzling over a heated stone, he knew that his dearest dreams had come true. That night, in the glow of the campfire, Rod listened to the thrilling stories of Wabi and the old Indian, and lay awake until nearly dawn, listening to the occasional howl of a wolf, mysterious splashings in the river, and the shrill notes of the night birds. There were varied experiences in the following three days. One frosty morning before the others were awake, he stole out from the camp with Wabi's rifle and shot twice at a red deer, which he missed both times. There was an exciting but fruitless race with a swimming caribou in Sturgeon Lake, at which Wabi himself took three long-range shots without effect. It was on a glorious autumn afternoon that Wabi's keen eyes first descried the log buildings of the post snuggled in the edge of the seemingly unending forest. As they approached, he joyfully pointed out the different buildings to Rod, the company store, the little cluster of employees' homes, and the factor's house, where Rod was to meet his welcome. At least Roderick himself had thought it would be there, but as they came nearer, a single canoe shot out suddenly from the shore, and the young hunters could see a white handkerchief waving them greeting. Wabi replied with a whoop of pleasure and fired his gun into the air. "'It's Minnetaki!' he cried. "'She said she would watch for us and come out to meet us.' Minnetaki. A little nervous thrill shot through Rod. Wabi had described her to him a thousand times in those winter evenings at home. With a brother's love and pride, he had always brought her into their talks and plans, and somehow, little by little, Rod had grown to like her very much without even having seen her. The two canoes swiftly approached each other, and in a few minutes more were alongside. With a glad laughing cry, Minnetaki leaned over and kissed her brother, while at the same time her dark eyes shot a curious glance at the youth of whom she had read and heard so much. At this time Minnetaki was fifteen. Like her mother's race, she was slender, of almost woman's height, and unconsciously as graceful as a fawn in her movements. A slight weaving wealth of raven hair framed what Rod thought to be one of the prettiest faces he had ever seen, and entwined in the heavy silken braid that fell over her shoulder were a number of red autumn leaves. As she straightened herself in her canoe, she looked at Rod and smiled, and he, in making a polite effort to lift his cap in civilized style, lost that article of apparel in a sudden gust of wind. In an instant there was a general laugh of merriment in which even the old Indian joined. The little incident did more toward making comradeship than anything else that might have happened, and laughing again into Rod's face, Minnetaki urged her canoe toward the floating cap. "'You shouldn't wear such things until it gets cold,' she said, after retrieving the cap and handing it to him. "'Wabi does, but I don't.' "'Then I won't,' replied Rod gallantly, and at Wabi's burst of laughter both blushed. That first night at the post, Rod found that Wabi had already made all plans for the winter's hunting, and the white youth's complete equipment was waiting for him in the room assigned to him in the factor's house a deadly-looking five-shot Remington similar to Wabi's, a long-barreled, heavy-caliber revolver, snowshoes, and a dozen other articles necessary to one about to set upon a long expedition into the wilderness. Wabi had also mapped out their hunting grounds. Wolves in the immediate neighborhood of the post, where they were being constantly sought by the Indians and the factor's men, had become exceedingly cautious and were not numerous. But in the almost untraveled wilderness, a hundred miles to the north and east, they were literally overrunning the country, killing moose, caribou, and deer in great numbers. In this region Wabi planned to make their winter quarters, and no time was to be lost in taking up the trail, for the log house in which they would pass the bitterly cold months should be built before the heavy snow set in. It was therefore decided that the young hunters should start within a week, accompanied by Mukoki, the old Indian, a cousin of the slain Wabigawan, whom Wabi had given the nickname of Muki, and who had been a faithful comrade to him from his earliest childhood. Rod made the most of the six days which were allotted to him at the post, and while Wabi helped to handle the affairs of the company's store during a short absence of his father at Port Arthur, the lovely Minnetaki gave our hero his first lessons in woodcraft. In canoe, with rifle, and in reading the signs of the forest, Wabi's little sister awakened constantly increasing admiration in Rod. 
to see her bending over some freshly made trail her cheeks flushed her eyes sparkling with excitement her rich hair filled with the warmth of the sun was a picture to arouse enthusiasm even in the heart of a youngster of eighteen and a hundred times the boy mentally vowed that she was a brick from the tips of her pretty moccasined feet to the top of her prettier head Half a dozen times, at least, he voiced this sentiment to Wabi, and Wabi agreed with great enthusiasm. In fact, by the time the week was almost gone, Minnetaki and Rod had become great chums, and it was not without some feeling of regret that the young wolf hunter greeted the dawn of the day that was to see them begin their journey deeper into the wilds. Minnetaki was one of the earliest risers at the post. Rod was seldom behind her. But on this particular morning he was late, and heard the girl whistling outside half an hour before he was dressed, for Minnetaki could whistle in a manner that often filled him with envy. By the time he came down, she had disappeared into the edge of the forest, and Wabi, who was also ahead of him, was busy with Mukoki tying up their equipment and packs. It was a glorious morning, clear and frosty, and Rod noticed that a thin shell of ice had formed on the lake during the night. Once or twice Wabi turned toward the forest and gave his signal whoop, but received no reply. "'I don't see why Minnetaki doesn't come back,' he remarked carelessly as he fastened the shoulder strap about a bundle. "'Breakfast will be ready in a jiffy. Hunt her up, will you, Rod?' Nothing loath, Rod started out on a brisk run along the path which he knew to be a favorite with Minnetaki, and shortly it brought him down to a pebbly stretch of the beach where she frequently left her canoe. That she had been here a few minutes before he could tell by the fact that the ice about the birch bark was broken, as though the girl had tested its thickness by shoving the light craft out into it for a few feet. Her footsteps led plainly up the shelving shore and into the forest. Oh, Minnetaki! Minnetaki! Rod called loudly and listened. There was no response. As if impelled by some presentiment which he himself could not explain, the boy hurried deeper into the forest along the narrow path which Minnetaki must have taken. Five minutes, ten minutes, and he called again. Still there was no answer. Possibly the girl had not gone so far, or she might have left the path for the thick woods. A little farther on there was a soft spot in the path where a great tree trunk had rotted half a century before, leaving a rich black soil. Clearly traced in this were the imprints of Minnetaki's moccasins. For a full minute Rod stopped and listened, making not a sound. Why he maintained silence he could not have explained, but he knew that he was half a mile from the post and that Wabi's sister should not be here at breakfast time. In this minute's quiet he unconsciously studied the tracks in the ground. How small the pretty Indian maiden's feet were! and he noticed, too, that her moccasins, unlike most moccasins, had a slight heel. But in a moment his inspection was cut short. Was that a cry he heard far ahead? His heart seemed to stop beating, his blood thrilled, and in another instant he was running down the path like a deer. Twenty rods beyond this point the path entered an opening in the forest made by a great fire, and halfway across this opening the youth saw a sight which chilled him to the marrow. There was Minnetaki, her long hair tumbling loosely down her back, a cloth tied around her head, and on either side an Indian dragging her swiftly toward the opposite forest. For as long as he might have drawn three breaths, Rod stood transfixed with horror. Then his senses returned to him, and every muscle in his body seemed to bound with action. For days he had been practicing with his revolver, and it was now in the holster at his side. Should he use it, or might he hit Minnetaki? At his feet he saw a club, and snatching this up he sped across the opening, the soft earth holding the sound of his steps. When he was a dozen feet behind the Indians, Minnetaki stumbled in a sudden effort to free herself, and as one of her captors half-turned to drag her to her feet, he saw the enraged youth, club uplifted, bearing down upon them like a demon. A terrific yell from Rod, a warning cry from the Indian, and the fray began. With crushing force the boy's club fell upon the shoulder of the second Indian, and before he could recover from the delivery of this blow, the youth was caught in a choking, deadly grip by the other from behind. Freed by the sudden attack, Minnetaki tore away the cloth that bound her eyes and mouth. As quick as a flash she took in the situation. At her feet the wounded Indian was half rising, and upon the ground near him, struggling in close embrace, were Rod and the other. She saw the Indian's fatal grip upon her preserver's throat, the whitening face and wide open eyes, and with a great sobbing cry she caught up the fallen club and brought it down with all her strength upon the redskin's head. Twice, three times the club rose and fell, and the grip on Rod's throat relaxed. A fourth time it rose but this time it was caught from behind, and a huge hand clutched the brave girl's throat so that the cry on her lips died in a gasp. But the relief gave Rod his opportunity. With a tremendous effort he reached his pistol holster, drew out the gun, and pressed it close against his assailant's body. There was a muffled report, and with a shriek of agony the Indian pitched backward. 
Hearing the shot and seeing the effect upon his comrade, the second Indian released his hold on Minnetaki and ran for the forest. Rod, seeing Minnetaki fall in a sobbing, frightened heap, forgot all else but to run to her, smooth back her hair, and comfort her with all the assurances at his boyish command. It was here that Wabi and the old Indian guide found themselves five minutes later. Hearing Rod's first piercing yell of attack, they raced into the forest, afterward guided by the two or three shrill screams which Minnetaki had unconsciously emitted during the struggle. Close behind them, smelling trouble, followed two of the post employees. The attempted abduction of Wabi's sister, Rod's heroic rescue, and the death of one of the captors, who was recognized as one of Wunga's men, caused a seven-day sensation at the post. There was now no thought of leaving on the part of the young wolf hunters. It was evident that Wunga was again in the neighborhood, and Wabi and Rod, together with a score of Indians and hunters, spent days in scouring the forests and swamps. But the Woongas disappeared as suddenly as they came. Not until Wabi had secured a promise from Minnetaki that she would no longer go into the forests unaccompanied did the Indian youth again allow himself to take up their interrupted plans. Minnetaki had been within easy calling distance of help when the Woongas, without warning, sprang upon her, smothered her attempted cries, and dragged her away, compelling her to walk alone over the soft earth where Rod had seen her footsteps, so that any person who followed might suppose she was alone and safe. This fact stirred the dozen white families at the post into aggressive action, and four of the most skillful Indian track hunters in the service were detailed to devote themselves exclusively to hunting down the outlaws, their operations not to include a territory extending more than twenty miles from Wabinosh House in any direction. With these precautions it was believed that no harm could come to Minnetaki or other young girls of the post. It was, therefore, on a Monday, the fourth day of November, that Rod, Wabi, and Mukoki turned their faces at last to the adventures that awaited them in the Great North. End of chapter 3